Hey guys, <clears throat> let's get started. My approach to physics is very conceptual, uh, which means that understanding comes first, and then we'll do a little bit of mathematics, and we'll, we'll get the mathematics on top of your understanding. So there's, there will be a lot of discussions. I do use my own PowerPoint, so this is being recorded. If you have a hard time taking notes, it's not a big deal. You can always go back and review the lectures. Like what you do. In fact, let me just give you uh, what physics is. Physics is an ancient Greek term. You don't need to take notes at this point. We're just going blah, blah, blah. All right, it's an ancient Greek term. When translated to English, it means philosophy of nature. All right, so let's talk about nature first and then we'll talk about philosophy. So what is nature? Nature involves anything and everything under the sun. Going all the way back to Big Bang. So energy turns into matter, right? We get atoms, atoms form molecules. From molecules, you get cells. From cells, you become you, I become me. And we have this little discussion, you get it? And so from the beginning of the universe to us meeting on Zoom and how this meeting comes about, the electronics behind it, the electricity, the magnetism, everything is physics, you get it? Everything is related to physics. So physics involves everything. All right, so the question is, what is philosophy? So those of you guys who have taken a philosophy course, does anybody remember the meaning of philosophy? So physics is a philosophy of nature, so what is philosophy? Anybody? All right, so uh, those of you guys, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is this like a set of ideas or, or um, something like wisdom or belief system? All right, I'm gonna give you five points. So if, those of you guys who have taken philosophy, the, the philosophy instructor must have told you that it's an ancient Greek term. When translated to English, it means love of wisdom. That's what it is. Okay, you may not be able to remember the exact definition of it. I got news for you. You do it on a regular basis, guys. Philosophy is something that you engage in on a regular basis. God knows, maybe 50 times a day. It's a two-step process of gathering. Step number one is your observation. Step number two is your theory. So you see something, you become curious about it, and your mind provides you with a theory. All right, so it's something that you do on a regular basis. Case in point. Um, I'm not a psychic, but I can make 100% accurate long-term predictions. In fact, the longer the prediction is the greater the accuracy of time. So guys, I'm gonna predict your futures. I'm gonna look into your futures and make one awesome prediction. And I know this prediction is gonna be 100% accurate. I will predict that each and every single person on this Zoom meeting is gonna be 100% dead within the next 100 years. All right, so this is one prediction that you can take great, great, great with you. All right, how, how do I know that you're gonna be dead in the next 100 years? Well, it's easy to tell, guys. Human lifespans are less than 100, okay? Barring any medical miracles, none of us, none of us will be around 100 years from now. Not a single one of us, all right? Um, every living thing ceases to exist at some point and same thing is gonna happen to us. So that's our observation. So the question is, there might have to die. All right, immediately when you ask this question, what happens? Your mind provides you with some theories. Some of you guys will say, I will say no. They may be saying, who knows? Most will say, who cares? All right, unless you're suicidal, sitting on the ledge of a building somewhere, all right? You don't really care about the question. Realistically speaking, Answer is either going to be yes or no. But can you find out without experiencing? All right, is there any way you can find out whether the answer is yes or no? What do you guys think? I don't believe so. Okay, so Jack, you don't believe so because? Well, because if you believe in an afterlife, you'd have to experience it. And therefore, I cannot come up with a 100% accurate answer without first experiencing it. Okay, I'm going to give you five points. Guys, the only way you will know for sure is by testing it, right? Okay, and when you test it though, you have to kind of test it on somebody else. So this is something that you can actually test in the first place. And the answer to that question is yes. What you need is you need to get a volunteer, like the way the psychologists do. And call the volunteer a subject, get a gun, put the gun next to the volunteer's head, pull the trigger, make sure that the person is dead before you leave. Leave the person there for about a week and then go back and invite the person back up and say, hey, is there life after death? Have you seen my grandpa? Is he in hell? Now you can have a conversation. So the question is, something like this, is it doable? The answer to that question is, if a person is dead for a week, guys, what are the chances that you're going to be able to revive the person back up? Guys, Jesus says the world record on like three days, right? A week beyond that? I don't think so. Can you even do an experiment like that? Can you kill someone in the name of science? Last time I checked in every single state in the United States, killing someone is still against the law. I don't know about Canada because they got free health care, but it cannot be done here. He says if a person is dead, the person is dead. There's no way of reviving, reviving the person, right? So unless somehow you can test the theory, you cannot know if the answer is yes or no. As sooner or later, we'll all experience it, but until then, is there any way to know? So the answer appears to be no, right? There's no way you could tell. If there's no way you could tell whether the answer is yes or no, then what do we do? We apply our belief system to it. We apply logic to it. All right, that's as far as you can go. This is what's called philosophy. You have an observation, it gets you curious. And then you come up with a theory, but now you cannot test the theory. This is philosophy. If you cannot test your theory, that's known as philosophy. If the theory is untestable, it's known as philosophy. Are we good on that? 
All right, now let's change the scenario around. You know the apple falls from a tree, you see an apple falling from a tree, and you know where the apple falls, right? Why does the apple fall? Gravity. Gravity. <laughs> gravity sucks. Man. All right, so apple falls because of gravity. Apple falls because of gravity. Is gravity a force? All right, so the question is, if gravity is the reason why objects fall, why doesn't the moon also fall from the sky? Okay, guys, notice what happened. What happened is, so we got about 17, 16 people in this room, and three, four of you guys spoke out. Okay, and, and most of you guys didn't say anything, despite the fact that the part of it is probably you're slightly intimidated. This is the first day. But if a little kid came up to you and asked you the same question, you would not be silent, especially if the kid is your own. All right, because the last thing you want the kid to think that you're a dummy, right? So as soon as the kid asks the question, your mind provides you with an answer. Right? Whether the answer is right or wrong, that's besides the point. But you're, you would be pulling stuff out of your ass so hard and so fast while hoping that this little kid would not remember what you just said by the time he or she becomes a teenager. That's, that's called being a parent. You don't want to look like a dummy in the eyes of your kid. All right, so your mind does the same thing. Every single person in this meeting has a theory regarding why the moon is not falling from the sky, right or wrong. Because that's what the, that's what the mind does. That's what your brain does on a regular basis. But the difference between this question and the previous one regarding whether there's life after death is the following. Whatever the theory that you have makes predictions which are testable. Uh, some of you guys are thinking, hey, dude, space is vacuum, man. There's gravity. It does not extend all the way out to the moon. Some of you guys are thinking, yeah, but the gravity, the force of gravity depends on the distance, so it's probably extremely weak. Whatever the theory is, whatever your theory may be, it makes no difference. Your theory is a testable theory. So how do you test the theory? The theory by experiment. That's it. So what happens is, Whenever your theory makes testable predictions, you test it and philosophy turns into science. So what's the difference between philosophy and science? The difference between philosophy and science happens when you get the theory. In philosophy, there are theories, but they are not testable. All right, theories make predictions. Is there a life after death? Yes, there is. No, there isn't. There's no way you can test it. In science, there are once again theories, but these theories are testable. So that's the difference. All right, uh, science is a step, three-step process of gathering information, philosophy is two. So you got the observation leading to a theory and the theory is gonna make test low predictions. That's what it is. All right, so if you had to characterize religion under science versus philosophy, how would you characterize it? Philosophy? Yeah, theology is more philosophy, right? It's more philosophy because you try to explain stuff and then you have all these theories, but a lot of the theories are not testable faith-based so you apply your faith to it or your logic to it or whatever all right so that's the difference between science as well as philosophy all right one observation and theory and theory makes no testable predictions in philosophy and theory makes testable predictions in science so that makes physics a science from nature you know? yeah so a lot of you guys think that science is a bunch of facts that you have to learn and memorize that's not true all right it's not a body of knowledge it's more a process of gathering information through the scientific method. All right, so this is the scientific method. All right, so process of gathering information by applying the scientific method is known as science. Any discipline that practices this is known as science. So psychology is science, chemistry is science, biology is science, sociology is science. All right, any, a, anything that follows scientific method is known as science. So physics is, <coughs> that's science. Let's talk about physics. Physics is everything and everywhere. When I apply to biology, living things, it turns into biology. Obviously, chemicals turns into chemistry. When I apply, <laughs> so was I sent you guys a text file, PDF file. All right, so this is what you will have to open up. More than a hundred. I'm gonna give you two observations so so that we can have a discussion. We're gonna hurt yesterday when a United Airlines jet traveling from Japan to Hawaii suddenly took a big dive. Eleven of those injured are still in the hospital tonight. Correspondent Bob Orr reports. <laughs> United Airlines Flight 826 was cruising six miles above the dark Pacific when the bottom fell out. His home video, taken just seconds after the Boeing 747 was jolted by turbulence, shows people with head injuries, dangling oxygen masks, luggage, food trays, and seat cushions strewn about the cabin. The jumbo jet with 393 people on board was nearly a third of the way from Tokyo to Honolulu. At about 33,000 feet, without warning, the plane hit a pocket of turbulence so severe it plunged a thousand feet in a matter of seconds. Unbuckled passengers and flight attendants who were in the process of serving dinner were slammed headfirst into overhead luggage bins. I went through the ceiling, said this battered passenger. I was panicked, said another.
people were crying everywhere. The jetliner with a hundred injured, a dozen seriously, turned back to Tokyo. Dazed and heavily banged, walked off the plane. Others were carried. And paramedics worked feverishly, but without success, to revive one Japanese woman who died of head injuries. While turbulence is a common occurrence, deaths and serious injuries are rare. Since 1981, major U.S. airlines have reported 252 incidents of severe turbulence. More than 800 people have been hurt, but only 63 of them seriously. And including last night's fatality, only three deaths. Virtually all of the injured and killed were not wearing seatbelts. Veteran pilot Rick Husted says too many. All right, so let me visualize this for you. Airplane, humbuckle passengers, uh, commercial airplane. The airplane flies into air servers. Passengers get slammed against the scene. So the question is why? All right, so what I would like you guys to do at this point is just take a moment. I'm going to give you a few minutes. And just jot down whatever it is that you're thinking of. All right, so collect your thoughts. The only th explanation I'm looking for from you guys is why is it that the um, unbuckled passengers end up getting slammed against the ceiling when the airplane flies into air terminals? Being that they weren't buckled down as the plane was doing the turbulence and changing in the altitude, wouldn't the people in the plane fall at the same rate? And that causes like the floating body sensation. Would it be in such a sudden drop in turbulence that's why they would slam against the ceiling? So, which, did you say they're all falling at the same rate? Well, like, okay, when the plane, like, when you suddenly the plane starts crashing and it, it does a sudden nosedive, people have noticed that they have, like, the kind of like the spaceship feeling where they, their arms feel is floating in the air. It's because they're kind of falling at the plane and the people are going at the same rate. They're not buckled down in their chairs, so they kind of levitate up. Or is it that the plane is uh, going faster than the people sitting down? That's why they end up getting smashed in the roof, in the top ceiling? Is it Newton's first law? Okay, so what is the Newton's first law? Ma uh, an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an opposite force. Uh, okay, so every single person who says something so far, give yourself 10 points. Give yourself 10 points. What else is that theory? Well, I was just going to say, yeah, it's, it's, it is Newton's where they're moving forward at one rate when suddenly they have nothing to bring them down at the same rate the plane does. So while they're still moving the same way, the plane's suddenly moving a different way, causing them to collide, even though they're inside of it. Okay, so why is, okay, I'll give you 10 points for that one. Who else? The plane started to drop at a rate faster than gravity, so then uh, everyone floated up when they were going to concentrate speed because they didn't uh, get acted upon with the turbulence, only the plane did. So you, you're saying that the airplane is falling faster than the passengers inside? Yeah. All right, I'm going to give you 10 points for that one as well. Okay, who else? Okay, so we almost have like three different series so far. It, variations of three different theories so far. So what else do you guys have? I can't come up with like a theory, but it just instantly reminds me of like why people get whiplash in a car accident. Oh, okay. So why do they get a whiplash in, in a car accident? Don't know why. I just know they do. So this is like the same thing. Yeah, I'm going to give you 10 points for that one. I, I know what you're talking about. You will know what, what's called sometime this week, actually. All right. Or maybe next week or the week after. <laughs> okay. So are we, does anybody else? Have anything to say? So give yourself ten points as well. Not bad, guys. Also, oh. Yeah, go ahead. Could it be? Could it also be um, because of the sudden G force that they experience that they end up hitting the ceiling? All right. So I'm going to give you five points for that one. You're talking about an impact force. My question is, why did they get slammed against the ceiling? All right. Um, what's the G force? Now that you mentioned it, I mean, what's your understanding of it? Uh, I mean, uh, um, like let's. Let's say you're, you're experiencing three times the, yeah. the G-force, you're experiencing three times your body weight and the normal well, uh, you, gravity. I'll give you five points for that one. That's that's beautiful, yeah. Uh, three Gs is three times your own body weight. 15 Gs is 15 times your own body weight. Yeah, we, we'll cover those. So that's impressive. So, so you got that from high school? Did you get that uh, one? Just watching that, so documentaries. Oh, that's perfect, yeah. I'll give you five points for actually watching documentaries. All right, um, okay guys, let me just go over what you guys said. Not everybody said the same thing, and most of you guys said a variation of three or four different things. Number one, some, most of you guys said, hey, bodies are gonna keep moving with the airplane in the same direction at the same speed, so the airplane changed direction. That's known as inertia, Newton's first law. All right, so you don't write anything down. We're having a discussion, so most of you guys said that. And I think one or two people said, everything is falling at the same rate, so somehow you just levitate and hover around a little bit. And for whatever the reason, they end up getting slammed against the ceiling. And one person said that the airplane is actually falling faster than the passengers inside. That's the reason why the airplane got, the people got slammed against the ceiling. 
And along the same lines, somebody said, it's like a whiplash, all right? Your body moves in the opposite direction of the push in a sense. Okay, so that's the meaning of it. Not bad, so you guys actually came up with quite a few theories. I, I counted up to four. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just change gears here. I'm gonna give you one more observation. Okay, all right, this brings me, brings us to my background in physics. Notice that the lectures are very visual. There's a reason why the lectures are real visual because I actually worked at an art school for about 20 years. Teaching physics, I was the uh, physicist at the art school full-time, the Illinois Institute of Art at Schomburg. It was a commercial art school. It was a really good school. It was my job. I loved it there. All right, so I was hired to teach physics to art students and they wanted these courses to be extremely visual. So I decided to keep that a format because it works for everyone. All right, so it's much more engaging. It's storytelling. You get a really good understanding of what's going on. Okay. Now, the following observation is designed for art students. Imagine that you're an artist, animation student. Uh, While well, imagine, just pretend that you're like one of the best to ever live, like Michael Jordan of animation or Einstein of animation. You're so good, in fact, that Disney makes you an offer, a million dollar salary upon graduation. And not only Disney knows that you're exceptional, exceptionally good, you also know that you're exceptionally good. So you're feeling a little bit cocky and you say no to Disney, you figure that you would do much better if you were to work for yourself. So you decide to start your own company and cater to the law firm. Here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna do animations and simulations for lawyers, all right? And if they win a case based upon your animation, you will grab 10% of the earnings. That's what you're going for. So you start your company, you struggle for a while, and your lucky day, an attorney walks right into your office. He's got a case for you. Evidently, the guy has a client who's paralyzed from neck down because, because of an elevator accident. And the guy remembers walking into the elevator when the elevator is on the 10th floor, and then he vaguely remembers everything going dark, and then he was told that he was in a coma for two months. And then he was also told that he's paralyzed from neck down. Now the investigation reveals that shortly after he walks into the elevator, the cable snaps, the elevator goes in a free fall. And lucky for him, there's a safety system that catches the elevator just before the final impact and brings the elevator to a very gentle stop. Except the guy has a broken neck. He was unconscious with a broken neck. He's taken to a hospital. Now he's suing the elevator company for $100 million. He's trying to recoup damages. Now, if they win, you will get that 10% of the money. That's $10 million, guys. That's 10 times more money than Disney was willing to pay. Except the only thing you have to do is a 30-second animation. What is it that you're animating? All right, so it's an animated first thing you do is a storyboard. All right, so you do a rough sketch of what it is that you're trying to animate. All right, so the guy's on the 10th floor. The table snap. Get a broken thing. All right, now you have to fill in the gaps. How did this person break his neck? 